They've been called beggars, con artists, and there are people who have been stereotypes and shrouded in secrecy. And they want to keep people away from them, and that can backfire on you because then they have misconceptions and they don't have accurate information, but that's the price the gypsies have paid. Officially, they are the Roma, but they're known everywhere as gypsies. From the moment they set foot in Europe, they were exiled, enslaved, and exterminated. In many countries today, they are the largest minority group and the most widely despised. One gypsy proverb speaks volumes. Bury me standing up. I've been on my knees all my life. Join us for The Curse on the Gypsies. The gypsies are coming, the old people say, to buy little children and take them away. And kitties, when they come to buy, it won't do any good to cry. From the Brothers Grimm to Charles Dickens, from Victor Hugo to Stephen King, Literature abounds with descriptions of dark-skinned exotics with the power of the evil eye. Traipsing from town to town in ragged clothes and horse-drawn wagons, telling fortunes, pulling con games, and playing hypnotic tunes on their melancholy violins, these fictional characters known as gypsies never fail to cast a pall over the sunniest of fairy tale landscapes. When I taught school, I would ask kids, I'm going to say the word gypsy, what comes to your mind? Poem readers, fortune tellers, crystal ball, um, violinist, dancers, long dresses. Those are some of the positive ones. Now, some of the negative, untrustworthy, stealing children, promiscuous. So prevalent are these images of gypsies that some people today actually think of them as the equivalent of ogres, dragons, elves, or other imaginary characters from medieval stories and myths. You ask any person on the street about gypsies and they will tell you about the different newspaper articles or TV stories or movie characters or the traditional gypsy folklore, if you will. But yet, very few know of the real people. Is it even possible to separate the truth from the stereotypes? Who are the mysterious and misunderstood people? The real gypsies. We are a race of people, the Rom. I would say Rom, but since you have to write it down, it's R-R-O-M, the Rom people, or the Romani race. It's a language, it's a culture, it's, uh, you know, they have uh, everything they need that qualifies them for a race of people. People said, are you a gypsy? I'll say, yes. Very proud of what I am, very proud of my background and my people, everyone. The people commonly known as gypsies are actually a distinct and ancient race. Because of their dark skin, dark eyes, and foreign dress, the Rom were mistaken for Egyptians by medieval Europeans. And in much the same way that Columbus mistook the natives of North America for Indians, the misnomer gypsies was passed down through the generations. Today, there are between eight and 12 million Rom spread over every continent of the world often residing in separate communities, sometimes integrated amongst the general population. There are many different kinds of gypsies, yet they all share the same distant origins and are ultimately related to each other. In fact, many Rom claim that anytime, anywhere, they can instantly recognize another of their heritage. Most of the Rom are dark skinned and black hair and dark eyes and you know from the behavior and dressing and so and when you run into another room the first thing what comes is Sian Rom which means are you Rom? 
Traditionally a nomadic people who first arrived in Europe at the turn of the 14th century, the gypsies are a people without a homeland and a culture without a country. They maintained their ethnic identity by living in close-knit groups and preserving their language known as Romani, as well as their way of life and traditions for over a thousand years. It's very difficult to describe gypsies to people who don't know anything about them or who only have misconceptions because they have kept so secretive and the literature is so full of wrong information that people are very tripped up on that. The secretive nature of the Romani culture has contributed to the plethora of myths and suspicions that surround them. In fact, because they kept no written records but passed down their history and culture in the oral tradition, almost everything about Roma, found in books or in the media, has been generated by outsiders. Viewing strangers with aversion and distrust, they have kept to themselves, as the misconceptions about them by the non-gypsies, whom they call gage, continue to multiply. We usually tend to stay together, and usually we don't trust other cultures, and it's thanks to the secrecy we still exist. Their secrecy has a basis in self-preservation. Throughout the centuries, the Rom have been unwanted strangers in nearly every country through which they have passed. In the Middle Ages, they were hunted like animals. In some places, they were legally enslaved until the middle of the 19th century. During the Second World War, they were rounded up by Hitler and exterminated en masse in his nightmarish death camps. Even in the United States of the late 20th century, people of Roma heritage often live and work side by side with the mainstream American population, afraid of revealing their true identities. When I was going to school, I remember my dad telling me, it's not really good to tell people what you are. Just tell them you're Italian or Mexican or something. Just don't tell them you're a gypsy. And I think that hiding who you are, becoming secretive, is a reaction to uh, what the race uh, has gone through throughout history. I would say that there's no period of history that we know of, that we have records of, where they're not persecuted. But they are survivors. As a group, they know how to do it. They have more experience than probably anybody in the whole world. Centuries of misinformation about the gypsies, their own secretive nature, and the paucity of written material about them, all combine to make the search for the truth about their past a difficult quest indeed. A veil of mystery enshrouds them. Why have they been victims of hatred and persecution wherever they have traveled? How did the all-pervasive stereotypes surrounding them arise? What are the unique cultural practices that they have preserved for nearly a thousand years? And perhaps the most puzzling and revealing question of all, from where did they come and why did their long journey begin? Music has been one of the gypsies' main contributions to world culture. Their arrangements have inspired composers from Franz Liszt to B.B. King. History's Mysteries will be right back here on the History Channel. Uniroyal tires with nail guard seal most tread punctures. In oh, my eyes. The fire that burns inside me drives me crazy. When I think of those I love who are so far away, I cry. Some traditional gypsy songs and poems are tinged with longing, with a nostalgia of a deep-seated yearning. But where is the far-off homeland that they may not remember, but still canonize in song? 
Scholars have wrangled long and hard over the gypsies' origins. Are they from Eastern Europe, from Persia, from ancient Egypt, as their nickname, Gypsies, suggests? It's been suggested, for example, that our ancestors came from the moon or from Atlantis, that we're not a distinct people at all, but uh, a conglomeration of the um, bits and pieces from the periphery of European society, and that our language isn't even a proper language. In point of fact, the Romani language is the key that unlocks the riddle of the gypsies. By tracing the roots of the language, peeling and examining its many layers like an onion, linguistic detectives have been able to uncover a virtual roadmap of the gypsies' travels and to pinpoint their unexpected starting place. You can trace the history of the language and, and also the history of picking up loan words, so that gives us some idea of the path of migration that the gypsies took. And because the language is based in Sanskrit, we know that it came from India. The language called Romani closely resembles the Hindi, Punjabi, and related languages of northern India. In addition, anthropological genetic blood tests reveal a proven physical similarity between people of Rom heritage and the present-day warrior classes of northern India. After centuries of controversy and debate, there is finally a consensus of opinion that the modern-day gypsies of the Middle East, Europe, Asia, and the Americas began their long journey from northwestern India. Today, gypsy groups can be found in such diverse places as India, Turkey, the Middle East, Europe, the Americas, Australia, and parts of Africa. Though no two groups are alike, all share a similar native language and many comparable customs and beliefs. In addition to the physical origins in India and the linguistic origins in India, the culture is also very Indian in many of its aspects. The spirituality is very Indian. Traditionally, scholars have argued over the date of the gypsies' departure from India. Why they left their homeland is a subject of even greater debate than when they left. One much-embraced theory of the last century was based on an epic historical poem in the Persian Shah Nimah, or Book of Kings, which described a group of 10,000 to 12,000 musicians, entertainers, and their families who were given as a gift to the Shah of Persia in the year 439. Within a year, according to the poem, these performers, the Zat, or Luri, were commanded to take their show on the road. Their fate is thus described in the Book of Kings. The Luri, agreeable to this mandate, now wander the world, seeking employment, associating with dogs and wolves, and thieving on the road by day and night. A population of Lom gypsies in the Middle East may indeed be descended from this lost band of musicians. But the Book of Kings theory does not explain the major migration of gypsies out of India, which occurred about 500 years later. In the past few years, we have been looking very, very closely at the clues which are in the language itself. Now, the language, the Romani language, although it's Indian very clearly, cannot be traced to any single dialect group of Indian languages. It has features from a number of them, which suggests, obviously, that the population, the original population, must have spoken more than one Indian language and must therefore have been assembled in some way for some purpose.
What could have been this purpose? At this moment in history, the Muslims were at the peak of their quest for world domination. They were spreading both westward and eastward, forcing their way into the northern reaches of India. Could the ancestors of the gypsies have been a force of specialized warriors called the Rajput, who with their families and camp followers were sent forth by the Indian kings to drive the invading Muslims from their borders? So we can imagine a, a population of mixed linguistic and ethnic origin being assembled uh, to push the Muslims out of India, following them out of India, but then becoming uh, involved in a series of confrontations with the spread of Islam. As time went by and as they became separated from India, Obviously, they closed ranks as an Indian population outside of India. Evidence from the language itself seems to support this military hypothesis. The core layer of the words in Romani contain a large military vocabulary. For instance, gaje, the term for a non-gypsy, literally means civilian, non-military person. Das, another term for an outsider, translates to prisoner of war. Other original words of the root language include terms for sword, spear, and battle cry. Whether they left as Hindu warriors or for some other reasons, such as famine or persecution, they left a virtual map of their root in the layers of foreign words added to their language over the years. The ancestors of the Ram came from northwestern India, moved in a straight line across to the coast of the Caspian, passed through Persian linguistic territory, pushed across the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains to the north coast of the Greek Byzantine Empire, now Turkey, then traveled on toward Europe. They were wanderers sometimes because they wanted to, but more because of push and pull vectors, because they were considered pariah. And as you wander, you learn how to survive by your wits. And you pick up things from the indigenous cultures that you're living for a long period of time or a short period of time. Along the way, the new additions to the Romani language suggest the length of their stay as well as how they might have survived in each new country. They must have remained a long time in Persia, where a layer of farming words was added to their vocabulary. Armenian words suggest their first contact with Christianity may have happened there. Over 200 Greek Byzantine words indicate that it was there that they took up the professions of metalworking, at which they became increasingly skilled, and which they could take with them if they were forced to move again. In the Byzantine Empire, where they stayed for at least 100 years, there also exist written records describing the gypsies supporting themselves by fortune-telling, herbal healing, and various means of entertainment. Those who lead bears around are called bear keepers. They place dyed threads on the head and on the entire body of the animal. Then they would cut these threads and offer them, along with parts of the animal's hair, as amulets and as a cure for diseases and the evil eye. But no enchanted amulet could protect the gypsies from their next trial, the violent fall of Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. The Muslims were also spreading out in other directions, including towards the Byzantine Empire, which they ultimately took over. And they kept on going and moved up into the Balkans. So the Ottomans were now in Europe. And the Romani population was kind of carried along on the, on the crest of the wave, up into Europe. If the gypsies thought they'd had a hard first 300 years, this early portion of their journey would pale in comparison to the fate that awaited them among the light-skinned peoples of Eastern and Western Europe. 
During the first decade of the 1300s, the same period the gypsies first came to Europe, in England, King Edward I standardized the yard and the acre. In Italy, Rome University was founded. And in France, King Philip IV ordered the expulsion of the Jews. To search any time in history, use the World Timeline at HistoryChannel.com. from those I love. At the turn of the 14th century, much of the world was in turmoil. The conquering Ottoman Empire was now turning its sight toward the west, and the Mongol Empire and its fearsome Tatar army, Batu Khan's Golden Horde, were slowly working their way south. With the fall of the once mighty Byzantine Empire, the gypsies had nowhere to go but toward the Balkan mountains of Eastern Europe which, for the time being, seemed to promise safe haven. The first historical traces of Roma in Eastern Europe place them in the principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia, now part of present-day Romania. These early arrivals found themselves in a society that was still mostly agricultural and technologically backward. So here come the Roma with important skills, especially metalworking skills. And they became so essential to the economy that laws began to be passed to make these employees property. By the time the Ottoman invasion had reached Transylvania and Hungary, some gypsies had been made slaves of the Turks. Others had become ensnared in the European feudal system they were forced into serfdom and eventually outright slavery by the landowners who had come to depend on their skills. This would only be the beginning of the gypsies' long and tragic history in Eastern Europe. It's kind of basically, we are going to give you a piece of land, but you're going to follow our rules, which are oppression, discrimination and slavery. So it's going on centuries and centuries. Meanwhile, some Roma managed to escape the feudal trap of Eastern Europe's Ottoman territories and continued their slow foray west. Their arrival sent shockwaves through the provincial world of medieval Europe they were dark-skinned and spoke a language no one had heard before. The people they were meeting who were horrified by their appearance and by the fact that they were not serfs on somebody's land, I mean, it was a really a different kind of group that people hadn't seen in Europe, so they needed an explanation of who they were. Desirous of preventing the enslavement of the Balkans from happening again, Many Rom groups seem to have discovered a unique and clever way to explain their unexpected arrival in the West. Christian Europeans during the Middle Ages were devoutly pious. And the gypsies, while they were in the Byzantine Empire, would have seen that religious pilgrims were always treated with the utmost respect and regularly gifted with alms, food, and shelter. And when they came, they were welcomed. These are people that they thought were pilgrims from perhaps Egypt, perhaps from the Middle East. And so they said, you come from Little Egypt. And they have nothing to do with Egyptians whatsoever. But they knew what to say, when to say it, and why they wanted to survive. They said, you know what, let them think what they want. I'll think what I want up here, but they won't bother me. And I can eat and raise my children for now in this encampment here. Thus, the nomadic travelers who had left their homeland in India some 400 years earlier became known to the Europeans as Egyptians or gypsies. The Rom used this case of mistaken identity to their advantage. 
By the early 1400s, Europe began to buzz with reports of organized groups of gypsies headed by leaders with impressive titles like prince, duke, and count. These bands of pilgrims arrived in Spain, in France, in Germany, in Italy, carrying with them imperial letters of safe conduct, ordering that the bearers be treated with all the kindness and civility due true religious penitence. Medieval historian Sebastian Munster met such a group of gypsies outside of Heidelberg, Germany. They presented him with a letter of safe conduct from Sigismund, the Holy Roman Emperor. It was told how their ancestors in Lesser Egypt had abandoned the Christian religion and turned to the era of the pagans, and that after their repentance, a penance had been imposed upon them that some members of their families should wander about the world in exile to expiate their sins. Sometimes the gypsies' letters of safe passage were real. Sometimes they were clearly copies or forgeries. Often the travelers would claim to be penitents. Sometimes they claimed other religious reasons for their nomadic journey. They even incorporated local religious customs into the complex web of spiritual beliefs they brought with them from India, thus easing their assimilation into the strange lands and cultures in which they found themselves. They adopted Christianity quite readily, and Mary became a very strong figure. When they came to the country, it was Czechoslovakia, a Protestant country, a Poland Catholic country, they became Yes, we'll become Catholic, we'll become Protestant. They, though, also kept some of their native cultural icons, and they celebrated days, you know, they celebrated a holiday to this person, uh, and it's not in the Christian religion, Western Christian religion, it was someone, who knows, it could have been just a relative uh, 300 years ago. But they generally adopted the religion of the host nation. For a few decades, the gypsies' religious pilgrim cover story seemed to work. The Rom, while not exactly welcomed by the Europeans, were at the very least treated with a modicum of respect and much curiosity. Roma clans moved from town to town, camping in fields, perhaps doing some tinkering, entertaining, or fortune-telling, in exchange for food and alms. They also appeared to be masters in the arts of herbal medicine. One gypsy healer was reputed to have saved the life of the King of Scotland himself. But between the mid-1400s and the turn of the following century, there began a marked deterioration in the attitudes of the Europeans toward the visiting populations of Roma. The German chronicler Aventinus, writing in 1522, echoes the mood of hatred and intolerance that had begun to spread several decades earlier. Gypsies. At this time, that thievish race of men, the dregs and bilgewater of various peoples, who live on the borders of the Turkish Empire and of Hungary, began to wander through our provinces under their king, Zindelo. And by dint of theft, robbery, and fortune-telling, they seek their sustenance with impunity. They relate falsely that they are from Egypt and are constrained by the gods to exile, but I have learned from experience that they are traitors and spies. In a world where everybody has his space, for Roma, there's nowhere to go. There's no territory. So you, you're moved from one area where you don't belong into another area where you still don't belong. Roma oral tradition maintains that the gypsies introduced playing cards, fishing lures, and the violin to Europe, and that they brought knowledge of how to manufacture muskets and cannon. Discover more about this and every History's Mysteries topic at HistoryChannel.com. And in black, and they ate like pigs. They were the most cunning thieves in all of the world. By the middle of the 16th century, Europe's fascination with the gypsies had turned to bitter suspicion, prejudice, and hatred. Roma were suspected for looking different, dressing different.
differently, speaking a language nobody recognized, supposedly having magical skills. There was color prejudice because the earliest accounts referred to the dark complexions and black hair uh, and likened them to sin because the, the sort of fundamentalist medieval Christian dogma made a very clear association between lightness and purity and darkness and sin. All over Europe, laws were laid down to keep gypsies who were lumped into the conglomeration of homeless wanderers known as vagrants, rogues, and sturdy beggars out of cities and towns. Legislation in Europe forbade Roma to stop anywhere, to buy provisions, or even to draw water from the village wells. Some Roma were forced to steal to survive, then condemned for it by the same people who had forced them into living as outlaws. If you are turned away from a shop, or even from the village pump, you can't get water. Um, you're forced to do that. You're not going to... Anybody would, would do whatever is necessary to feed a child. Rumors about the gypsies became ingrained in local European lore. Roma were said to be adept at stealing village children, whom they would supposedly indoctrinate into the evil gypsy life. These far-fetched tales found their way into folklore and literature and persist even today. The gal I was in love with when I was, in, when I was about 10 years old was Shirley Temple, <laughs> as a lot of young boys were. And I'm watching Heidi, and the mean, wicked stepmother is going to sell her to the gypsies. And she's dragging Shirley Temple to the wagon. We're going, oh, no, Shirley, the gypsy is going to get you. And I realized for a second, oh, we're the bad guys? This, is, this can't be. Other variations of the stories had the gypsies boiling babies in their stews and devouring them for dinner. There were laws in, in medieval Europe. Roma had to cook outside in full view of the world and any uh, citizen could go and tip the pot over to see if there were bits of baby in there. And they would go the, the meal for the day, but that would happen. In modern psychological terms, the stories of Roma stealing children seem to be a perverse kind of projection on the part of the Europeans. In truth, many laws allowed for gypsy children under the age of 14 to be forcibly taken from their families and sold into slavery. In the 1500s, a Romani child could be sold into slavery for the equivalent of 48 cents. As time went on, the edicts against Roma became not only oppressive, but deadly. During this period, 15th century and into the 16th century, it was illegal to be a gypsy. Gypsies were hung on sight. Um, gypsies were, would be killed. I mean, families would be rounded up and killed. In many parts of Europe, it was legal to hunt down and kill gypsies as if they were wild animals. In 1547, King Edward VI of England passed a law declaring that gypsies be branded with a V on their breast, then enslaved for two years. If they ran away and were caught, they were made slaves for life to not be connected to a piece of land, to not be connected to some lord of this area, was in and of itself a suspicious kind of behavior. So there was a lot of um, attempt to get them to settle down, to stop them from moving around, to outlaw their whole life. In Spain, King Philip IV decreed that the Romani language be outlawed and that gypsies be settled into separate Romani enclaves. Their beautiful native tongue gradually died out there. In other countries, Roma were rounded up and exported as slave labor to colonies in the New World, including America. In Eastern Europe, 
Where most Roma had been enslaved since the arrival of the feudal system, the word for gypsies, Tsigan, became synonymous with slave. Often the prime Rom women were taken for breeding purposes with the non-gypsy population. The half-white children from these unions automatically became slaves themselves. Gypsy men were castrated so as not to present a threat to the local noble women they served. Yet despite the years of persecution and slavery, the Rom clung with tenacity to their way of life and to the language and unique customs they carried with them from their long forgotten homeland in India. Christopher Columbus took gypsies with him on his third voyage to the Americas. History's Mysteries will be right back here on the History Channel. Tonight. Throughout the centuries, despite hatred, persecution, and despite being forced to live and work among a diversity of societies, the gypsies have managed to preserve their ancient language and their culture. The gypsy language is a universal language. I have film from Europe, and gypsies are talking in the gypsy language. And with just a different slang, I could understand what they were saying, but yet I do not speak the language of the country that the movie was filmed in. A Romani family in Hungary will speak Hungarian and Romani, much like I speak English and Romani. And so the language pretty much has, has survived, although you'd have to learn the different uh, dialects and you know, accenting certain words. You'd have to study it. Um, each, cult, each group, which would take a lifetime. From their cultural practices to their language, Roma have always been secretive and evasive, primarily for their own protection. Their years of slavery and oppression taught them to be wary of information they give to outsiders. Therefore, they have gained a reputation as liars, though most often distortions of the truth have their roots in self-preservation. There's a secretiveness among the gypsies, and they want to keep people away from them. And the less they know, the better. And that can backfire on you, because then they have misconceptions, and they don't have accurate information but that's sort of a price the gypsies have paid. Though they have adopted customs of some of the countries through which they have passed, gypsies have also carried with them their traditional occupations. Their metalworking skills may have originated in the Byzantine Empire, but in India, a good fortune teller or spiritual healer would be regarded with the highest esteem and status. Those vocations have remained popular with some Roma until this day. With fortune telling, there is a skill, and that skill is observation. We have been through hell uh, for centuries, and what that has done has, has uh, trained the Roma people to be very observant, to watch what's happening, be aware of your surroundings, to listen to every word and how the person is saying it, look at their eyes. So when a fortune teller is sitting with you, they're really listening to you. They were uh, these sort of roving psychologists. They were very smart. They knew that these peasants, they needed to hear a positive voice, an outside voice, to reassure them to, to make up something about the future. It was an easily transportable skill. It was also a, a protection up to a point because people would have been a little less likely to be mean if they thought you had some sort of control over their destiny. Another mechanism by which gypsies have kept themselves separate comes from within the culture itself, in one of many aspects of Romani life brought with them all the way from their long forgotten homeland, India. One of these Indian characteristics is the idea of ritual purity and ritual pollution. 
And this extends into all kinds of areas. It extends into uh, how you prepare food, how you interact with uh, members of the opposite sex, uh, how you wash things, even where you hang clothes on the line. It's based on the notion of keeping body fluids separated. So women have an obligation when they're menstruating to stay away from men. Childbirth is a period where women are to be kept separate from men. These pollution rules or cleanliness rules may have some variations in various parts of the world, but they, all, they have them and they are a very important part of, of keeping themselves separate. If a Rom marries a non-Rom, he or she then becomes marame, or polluted, and can be rejected from the group. Throughout the centuries, gypsies have continued to observe these strict rules of behavior in order to preserve their ties to their families and their culture. It's also helped to breed uh, resentment because people don't like to be rejected. People don't like to be brushed off and turned away. Either it will hurt their feelings personally, or they'll say, well, they must be hiding something. They must be up to something. While in many countries, such as Spain and Hungary, Roma were forced by law to stay in one place, throughout the Middle Ages and on into the 20th century, many gypsies managed to retain the nomadic existence that had become their cherished way of life. I ran recently into the, some old folk tales of Roma, Romani folk tales. It's like um, to never sleep twice in the same place, um, to never eat three times in the same spot, to never wash twice your face in the same river. That shows how Roma were tend to keep going. History's Mysteries will be right back here on the History Channel. Strangers in strange lands, war forced them west. They survived by their skills and by their wits, managing to keep their ancient culture alive. But as they approached the millennium, they still struggle under a curse, not on others, but instead, a curse on the gypsies. I think of the gypsies as hunters and gatherers of the modern world. And hunters and gatherers and nomadic people are very misunderstood, no matter what group it is. As the Middle Ages melted into the latter centuries of the second millennium, the gypsies, along with all the rest of the Western world, found themselves living in a society turned upside down by rapid technological changes. The Industrial Revolution was on the horizon, as were a wave of social upheavals that were about to sweep through all of Europe. In Romania, the Moldavian and Wallachian Rom, known as the Vla, had been enslaved by the church and the crown for over 500 years. With the end of feudalism at hand, the lives of the Vla Rom were destined to improve. In 1864, following the Crimean War, Prince Ion Cusa officially granted 600,000 Romani slaves their freedom there was uh, a move on the part of a lot of the freed slaves to get out of Romania. Those who were able to get away did, many managing to come as far as North and South America. America's open door policy allowed thousands of Hungarian and Vla Roma to settle and establish themselves. Some of them continued their traveling life. Others formed comfortable communities in places such as New York and California. 
Tom Marino's grandfather was part of an enormous wave of gypsies who came to the New World to escape oppression and economic hardship during the late 1800s up through the turn of the century. I'm sure that there's a lot of uh, grandpas and grandmas out there who are watching this saying, oh yeah, remember the gypsies coming through? They would just set up a tent along a river, ask the farmer if they could stay for a few days, and the girls would tell a few fortunes if people stopped by. The men would make repairs, and they would move on. My mother and father, which are now both deceased, they lived a traditional gypsy life, which was the traveling. They did a complete circuit of the United States. In the summertime, in the northern parts, in the northern states, and then in the wintertime, they would either go to California, Arizona, Texas, Florida, and they would uh, have their own immediate lifestyle. Only a small percentage of the freed Rom of Romania traveled to the Americas for asylum. Some migrated to areas of Europe where their brethren were already free and found ways to adapt their nomadic way of life to the social and economic earthquakes rumbling all around them. In England, the trades of coppersmithing, tinsmithing, entertaining, and fortune-telling served them well until the end of feudalism. When the Industrial Revolution burst upon the scene, they found some practical ways to adapt, adding new variations to the occupations upon which they had relied for more than 800 years. They made the old gypsy peg out of a piece of willow. At the same time it was making pegs, it was making a chrysanthemum flower out of a piece of elder. All the family would be involved, and they would drive then into a village. The lady would go with them, and she had a basket on her arm, and she would fill that with pegs, lace, and flowers. Then she would go knocking on all the doors around, telling fortunes and selling her pegs, lace, and flowers out of the basket. And at the same time, she would say that her husband is the other end of the village with his grinding barrow sharpening all the knives from. And that is how they got a living. <laughs> Trading in horses, bricklaying, and other manual jobs, as well as salvaging scrap, were other traditional forms of employment. None required a regular paycheck or a permanent address to provide an adequate income. As these modernized ROM moved from place to place, their modes of transportation began to change as well. By the late 19th century, the now legendary silhouettes of the gypsy caravans began to appear on the outskirts, on the roads, even in the parks of major urban centers. British-born Rom, Gordon Boswell, collects and restores rare, authentic gypsy caravans and displays them in his Romany Museum in Spalding, England. There's about a 90-year lifespan of these wagons from about 1865 up to about 55 was the last genuine ones to be built. In one old book of Dickens's, Charles Dickens's book, it mentions that he saw a cottage-type thing coming down the road made out of wood on four wheels being pulled by two horses. That was actually the first mention of one in any book. If you could afford to have a good home made, the coach builders of the day would make them. But a lot of the gypsy people made some themselves. Not just ordinary paint, 22 karat gold leaf was put on all these wagons and cart. I suppose the more gold leaf you had on your wagon, it showed more wealth you had. These lovingly decorated, picturesque caravans, as well as the Roma's nomadic way of life, stood in stark contrast to the bleak and oppressive climate of the urban industrial revolution, and triggered yet another change in perception of the gypsies by the non-gypsies, whom they called the gage. The kind of ugly life described by Dickens, for example, led to a kind of angst on the part of writers and painters and so on, longing for 
an earlier, simpler time. And Roma epitomized this. They were outside of all of this, still living in the fields and forests and catching and rabbits. And uh, they became idealized. The Europeans of the Industrial Revolution romanticized the gypsies as Americans did the noble savage. Most of this fanciful new literature only sustained the original cliches, depicting gypsies as wild and uninhibited dabblers in the occult and crafty thieves. During these rapidly changing years, the hardy, adaptable Rom managed to resist the magnetic force pulling hordes of other lower-class workers into the world of wage labor. A gypsy wedding traditionally lasts three days and nights, but it's not until the third night that the couple is allowed to consummate the marriage. History's Mysteries will be right back here on the History Channel. Property owners, if weeds and brush are taking over your property, at last... I was more than happy if we could sign our own name and look at a signpost and know where we was going. They, that's all they wanted. And this is why I think we've got our culture still. Now, if we went and to the secondary school, all the teachers would be teaching us is how to go and get a job, how to go and get a good job. We don't want a good job. We, we've got our own way of getting a living. Their educational system, if you want to call it that, is pretty amazing. It's very, very good. It's not based on literacy, though. It's not based on learning from reading. It's based on very keen observing. They learn to think on their feet, and they teach their children to do that. Children and the institution of the family have always been of paramount importance in the Romani culture. Romani families are strict in this sense. They've got to watch out for each other. They've got to take care of their children, know where they are. My family, uh, my friends were my, my relatives. You know, I grew up with friends who are my first and second cousins, and we had this huge family, so I was, I was never without playmates. You know, we'd always visit somebody on a Sunday. There'd be this big feed at Grandma's house. My childhood was, um, I had a happy childhood. An American Rom of Serbian descent, Tom Marino grew up in a traditional Roma community. Although still close to his family, he left the traditional lifestyle to pursue a career as a filmmaker. If I had stayed in the culture, what was likely to happen is that there would be a marriage, uh, which would be a girl selected for me. Both parents will get together and talk about what a good match this would be. There's a lot of uh, talk, a lot of politics, a lot of backslapping, and uh, then if everything's right and the dowry's right, uh, there's a marriage. great, it lasts for two or three days. They really know how to have a good time. Another occasion that traditionally brings large groups of gypsies together is the death of a friend or relation. People come from miles to these funerals. And during the period of time when the body is laid, uh, we never eat meat during that week, and some never eat at all. And they certainly don't go to bed. No, they never take their clothes off. We never go to, to bed. It's a respect for that person. We're with them as long as we can be while they're, while they're on Earth. Authentic caravans, like those found in the Boswell Museum, are extremely rare. 
in part due to the tradition of burning a person's possessions, including their wagons, after they have passed away. Not just their home is burnt. The favorite horse, nine out of 10 times, was put to sleep. The horse and the harness and the wagon was all put together and burned. They have a period of about a year in which they work towards putting that person to rest. And they do it through a series of feasts called Pomani. And the spirit of the person is said to be there and, and they pick somebody to wear clothes to represent that person. The idea is that that person is restless after dying and then they sort of are are no longer restless and the family has paid its dues and they can move on. A long-standing myth among the Gage has been that the enigmatic king of the gypsies presided over these major community events. Many Rom have been described as kings or queens throughout the centuries. The idea of the king of the gypsies is like everything else related to the gypsies partly not true and partly actually promoted by the gypsies. And it was a way when outsiders came and said, what's going on here, who's in charge? They would have a king and it would be maybe somebody who's their spokesperson or a leader that could deal with the non-gypsies. What we do have is heads of families in different cities who control an area and they impersonate or sell themselves by saying, I am the gypsy king in this area. By saying that, your culture, the non-gypsy culture, likes to hear, I am the king, I am the representative. It opens doors. It means something. But in reality, there are no kings, there are no queens. That's a fallacy that was made by non-gypsies years ago. Gypsies currently make up 14% of the population of Eastern Europe. History's Mysteries will be right back here on the History Channel. Flamenco music and dance. Franz Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsodies. Even some elements of American jazz, swing, and blues. Have all found their inspiration in the original instrumentations and melodies that the gypsies brought with them from India. Rama brought across many instruments like cymbal, guitar, a lot of drums and percussion and tambourine and get involved in a lot of famous musical music like Hungarian chardas, the flamenco music. These are Indians, so we hear Indian modalities. The hand movement, the arm movement, the finger symbols and the bells of flamenco dancing comes from India. The drumming is from India. Often they'll have a taksim, which is Arabic for improvisational playing. They're kind of blues, I call it, and that's very Ram stylistic. It, it's emoting. They're speaking through their their playing that non-rhythmical, melismatic uh, music. Since the Ram tradition was not a written one, musical ability passed from generation to generation and became an important means of keeping a culture alive. Rom, they have a tradition and it's long storytelling. 
And they would tell these stories of famous Ram in the region. And sometimes music would help tell the story. They would say, great grandmother used to sing me this song when I was very young. I was three and I still remember it. And here are the words. And they play and they sing. And at their knees, at their ankles are their babies. So in that sense, they carry on traditions and tell history.